welcome back to the next lesson. I'm doing a lesson this time on ways of holding things on the lathe. Probably a lesson I should have done a long time ago towards the beginning because this is very basic. So if you've been turning for a while, many of the things I share with you today may be things you're already familiar with. But if you're new to turning, let me give you some options for holding things. I'm going to talk first about holding things between centers on the lathe, which would be spindles or maybe a start of a bowl project or another project. And then I'm going to talk about using face plates and chucks for other kind of projects. So let's take this in stages. First of all, I want to talk about holding things just between centers. And I think most of you are familiar with our standard spur drives, whatever kind you happen to have. Uh, the four prong spur drives are really nice when we're dealing with green wood because it tends to dig into the fibers of the wood really well on the end of a spindle. These points on some of the better ones, as you can see some screw holes here, allows for that point to be adjusted so that it can be made proud of the spurs or not. These spurs tend to get dull after a while and you may actually want to go in here with a file and sharpen the back edges of these so they do bite in well. So spur drives provide the driving force on spindle projects. There's a spur drive that's used many times when we're doing a class on, uh, let's say, natural edge bowls, where repositioning the wood several times on the lathe may be necessary. In that case, I might use a two-prong spur drive that allows me to move the wood back and forth, where this limits me a little bit more on that. Two-prong spur drive. Small projects, there's a spur drive. Not an adjustable point on this one, but very small for dealing with small spindles. Many times when we're dealing with hardwoods in our beginning classes, we use what's called a multi-spur drive. This is available in different sizes. The point on this one is spring-loaded, so it will not bite into the wood, but it does center. But these little multi-spurs bite very easily and require much less pressure to hold it on the lathe. Here's a spur drive I'll show you again later when we deal with chucks. This one's designed to fit actually into the jaws of a chuck. It's a four-prong drive, an adjustable point. And I'll come back to this one later and show you how it mounts in your four-jaw chuck. Last one I want to show you is called a safe drive. And I don't see this used very much, but it's a great drive because as you push in, this cup around here bites into the wood. More pressure, more holding force. Less pressure, less holding force. That means if you were, for instance, teaching the use of a skew chisel, and you get a catch. If my pressure set right, the wood will just stop turning. It will slip on this, thus allowing you to save your project, save your nerves, and go back to work and continue to practice. Safe drives. Uh, I have maybe a dozen of these at home for when I teach skew chisel classes. We can use this as the driving force. Well, that what powers the wood on the lathe. Let's look what holds it on the other end. The most common type of live center is this one right here. It has a point, many of which are removable, and many of which when these get tapped out of the lathe, the point comes out and goes flying into the sawdust and we never see it again. But this was the one that comes with most of the inexpensive lathes. We buy a lot of these, these are aftermarket, they also are live centers and spin. They're less expensive, and because we lose so many centers here at the studio, uh, we have a number of these to replace. Same thing, the point centers, the cup around here keeps it from digging into the wood too far. We use a lot of this one. This, if pushed into soft wood, green wood, will tend to keep burying itself. However, if I have a hole drilled in the end of a project, many times this will allow me to push into the hole, pretend like this, if there's a hole. 
and that would allow me to be able to center up on the tailstock end. So we use a lot of these. Again, they're fairly inexpensive. Some of the older ones of these, where the point has been lost, I've modified into doing specialty chucks. I've glued on a piece of wood that has been cup shaped. The matching piece that goes into the headstock is here. This is for doing spears or balls. I can clamp between these two points. So older ones that get damaged or abused can ultimately be converted into another project. My most favorite one, the one I use at home constantly, is the one made by One Way Manufacturing. There are other brands that look very similar and function precisely the same way. This is a live center, has three sets of ball bearings in here, and it has a number of accessories that can be screwed onto the end. It comes with a small cone, works like this guy. It has the point and cup without the cone. And it has a larger cone, which can be used this way, or this way for centering up projects. That's nice, it has a lot of features. However, it also has another feature. I can purchase these devices, which screw onto here, allowing me now to use this live center with one of my chuck threads. This is a one by eight thread. one and a quarter by eight, and there's a 33 millimeter. So that means I can fasten face plates, chucks, or any other thing that has a standard screw thread <coughs> onto the tailstock of my leg. Additionally, because this is a knockout bar, instead of locking the bearings, I can push this little point out of the end. And there are a number of replacement points for it. Here's a straight one. Here's one that has a little tiny point on the end of it. These allow me to work on very, very small projects because the taper in here is a zero Morris taper and these are tapers so they can be easily replaced here. A lot of versatility. One of the more expensive life centers that you can buy, whether it's the Jet, um, Laguna, or the original one-way brand, it's well worth the expense. So that's holding things between center on the leg. I want to talk about things held just on the headstock. So I'm going to talk about face plates next. Give me a second to clean up and bring some other things over here into the line of sight. Be right back. Cleaned up a little bit, moved the spindle settings out of the way, and brought in face plates. I want to talk about face plates in two different sections. Commercial ones, which I'll talk about second, and ones that you have made yourself. First of all, I use a lot of face plates in the classroom that are made out of nuts and washers that have been welded up. And the nice thing about these things, they're inexpensive. The other thing though is when a glue block is fastened to them, I don't know whether this plate is exactly at 90 degrees to the nut or not. But if I'm using a glue block screwed on, when I put this on the lathe and face this off, I will be true. So with handmade or home-bought face plates, I would suggest always use a glue block so that you can re-true to the axis of the lathe. That's point one. Point two, this one has a number of flaws. And I like to point them out because it, it's a little learning there. First of all, there's two, four, six holes in here. There's only four screws. If the faceplate has a whole series of holes, use them all. Use them all. Secondly, we mounted this faceplate. I'll take it off. With Phillips screws. Not a good idea. The reason is Phillips screws, these heads get eaten. And after a couple uses, the screws are no good. And you'll end up having to throw them away. Always use a hex head 
so I can drive that in each time and remove it as many times as I want without damage to the screw. These are self-tapping machine screws and they are perfect for coming into the wood. Self-tapping has some advantages but also has some disadvantages. For instance, if I look at the back of this, in each case where these screws have been inserted, the wood has been pressed up. As the screw goes into the wood, the fibers have to go somewhere. Generally, they're pressed upward. What that means is the faceplate is no longer setting flat to this piece of wood because of this problem here. I suggest that you always pre-drill before you mount your faceplate, thus preventing this wood from uh, piling up and forcing the faceplate out of squareness. As I said, I prefer ones that be driven with a hex drive. They can be easily taken out and they can be reused as many times as you need. The second thing about using glue blocks on your faceplate is always use cross grain wood so that as the screw goes in, it's going in across the fibers and biting. If you put a piece of end grain wood in here and put the screw in, the chance of it pulling out is real high. So do not do that. Also, when you glue something onto the other side of an end grain piece, you're not going to get as tight a glue joint, quite tight as uh, fast, as if it's cross grain. So always use cross grain wood. Always use all the screw holes. As you noticed here, I've kind of turned away a little bit in the center. I have a tendency to do that on a lot of my faceplate glue block combinations. It's easier for me to flatten three-fourths of this rather than the whole thing. So the center, I just dish out a little bit. Here's another homemade faceplate. Believe it or not, I have a number of these and they work really, really well. This is done in, looks to be ash, maple, ash, elm, anything that's a really, really hard wood. This, I have cut threads to match my lathe. And this screws on to the headstock. Projects then go on the other side. If I get this all used up, I can easily throw it away because it cost me virtually nothing to make. It came out of scrap. How do you do that? Beal sells a series of taps. This is an inch and a quarter tap for tapping that hole. There's a one by eight. There's also a 33 millimeter. So take a piece of wood, drill and tap. And you do have to have a tap. So once you purchase one of these, then you're in good shape for continuing with your own personal faceplates. For my little tiny projects, I really like these. They're much lighter. I forgot to mention, we have the Beal taps for making these faceplates. They also make a third tap. And it is a three-quarter ten, which is designed to screw projects onto the end of this one-way live center system. So if you want to make your own adapter or your own fitting, they also have a three-quarter ten that allows you to fit onto the one-way jet and Laguna live centers. So when we look at commercial faceplates, the next portion of this, we've got aluminum anodized. We have steel, we have cast iron, a number of different options. On all these better ones, you'll see here, 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 set screws. The purpose of the set screw is to fasten this onto the headstock of the lathe in such a way that if the lathe is put into reverse, it will not unscrew. So you fasten this onto the lathe, you take your Allen set screw and tighten this down. See it back here, I think, better. On this one. So if you're doing sanding, let's say by turning the lathe into reverse for the next grip, the product will not automatically unscrew. So look for the set screws. Now this has a lot of extra holes. My sense is if it's a smaller product, I would use this drill hole pattern. If it was a larger face plate, I might use this larger pattern here. Many times, here's a commercial one, a lot of the mistakes on it. I see there are Phillips head 
uh, screws in here, which is probably not going to hold really good. But many times after I part off a product, I leave some of the wood here. My faceplate glue block combinations tend to get longer over time rather than shorter. So I have to come on and keep retruing this. This one's been, well, there's Purple Heart. The last thing I parted off of here looks like was walnut. This is another aluminum one, a little better done. All the holes are filled, still the wrong screws. But this is a product that must have been from a segmented vessel that I ended up with because this is a small segmented ring. Perhaps the next project I do, I can just glue right onto this and continue to use what was there. Not for sure. Let me clean up one more time. And I want to talk about chucks. Another way to hold things only on the headstock, like faceplates. Last section of this presentation, I want to talk about four jaw scroll chucks, what we just refer to as chucks. Uh, there's a several different brands. There are those most popular ones would be uh, the ones from One Way Manufacturing, which I happen to have here in two different sizes. If you didn't have a ruler, you couldn't see them next to each other, they'd look exactly like. This is called the Stronghold. This one's called the Talon. For smaller lathes, this is plenty big enough. There are other brands on the market. Uh, this is a Nova Chuck, a different brand, set up with a different kind of jaws. These jaws are specific for holding pen blanks, for turning holes in pen blanks. Jaws can easily be interchanged on all these different jaws. Smooth jaws, larger diameter, smaller diameter. These are textured. These are dovetailed and not textured. And so there are various different options which you can get. Um, this is the brand we happen to be using in class. It's not anything particular about it except that these have a straight jaw. Many of the competitive chucks have a dovetail shaped jaw. And I've done it this way only so all of our chucks have the same configuration when we teach a class for no other purpose than that. One of the features for most chucks is the ability to mount a spur drive, a screw chuck, down in the base of these jaws for mounting like a bowl blank, drill of, of 5 8 hole, and screw right onto this. The product sets flat against these jaws. This will hold it sufficiently while we put a tenon, let's see, on the other side. If you don't want to take the chuck off the lathe and you need to do some spur drive work, well, let me open this up a little bit more here. There's a spur drive that also sets in here. So there's a lot of options. We've got this brand. We have the Vicmark, which is another very famous brand uh, with various different types of jaws. I mentioned that. The Nova Chucks, another brand. This chuck is made to fit a 1 by 8 threaded lathe. It is not an insert, as in many of these other chucks, for instance. This chuck can be made to fit any lathe by simply changing this insert. This is set up for an inch and a quarter lathe. I can take that insert out. Oh, this is also set up the same, but I could pull this out and set it up for a one by eight lathe. Same thing with the Vicmark chucks. And many of the Nova chucks have inserts that can be removed and replaced. This particular brand does not. Cute, but I thought you might be interested in seeing this. This is another, this is a three jaw chuck. operates with the levers, as most of our four jaw chucks used to in the old days. They're now all differently, but this has a number two Morris taper on the other side. So this will fit into the headstock to hold very small projects. It also comes with a shaft that can be replaced if it's a Morris taper one lathe. 
Uh, not too many of those around anymore, but there still are some. But here's another option. Chucks also can be adapted to completing projects. Let me push these back out of the way a second and bring in something else. This is what's called a set of jumble jaws or coal jaws, depending on the brand. And like the other jaws, these can be easily replaced, but the product sets here. These then, with the rubber bumpers, close in around the edge, allowing you to complete the base of a project. Uh, they come in different sizes. This is a medium size. There's bigger ones and smaller ones. And they're available for everybody's chuck uh, brand has a set of larger jaws like this. If you didn't want to mount those, there's one last option. Pull out a picture a second and show you what is called a Longworth chuck. This is a chuck where if I turn these two plates against each other, these arms come in and will grab right at the edge of a plate or platter or bowl. The back side, this is a slight dovetail, this just sets right in the jaws, the standard jaws of your four jaw chuck. So the chuck stays on the lathe, this fastens into the chuck, the product then can be held here. So when we're holding by the rim of a product, you, we recognize that it's a, not a great hold, so we work very carefully to complete off the bottom of that project. Another way to hold on the lathe was vacuum chucks, which we talked about a few lessons ago, so I won't review that, but that's another way to complete off a product. So, quick review for some of you, uh, maybe some new information for others. I hope you enjoyed learning how to hold things on your wood lake. See you in the next lesson.